You guys know me pretty well. I know a lot about preparedness and survival type things like wilderness survival. I don't know as much as some people, but I know more than most people. And I know a lot about this word, and I know a lot about Torah, not as much as some people, but more than most people, and it strikes me that y'all know more about the word in Torah than most people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ever think about that. After this, remind me about the guy at, that I worked with one time that said, I'm walking down the hallway, and he goes, I'm a pretty bad man. And then that went on and on and on, but that's not appropriate for this. Well, but I will tell you about that. But you guys know more about Torah than most people. Think about that, because that's it's a big world. When I talk on my videos every day about preparedness or survival or stuff like that, I often forget how much I know and where I'm at now compared to where I used to be. And I assume that my audience knows the things I know. And, and many times that is an incorrect assumption. And the same thing goes for the word in Torah. I assume that we all know kind of what I know about Torah, and sometimes that's just not true. So sometimes it's good to go back and revisit the basics, if you will, of things. So with that in mind, in Proverbs, which you, you can turn there if you want, but you don't have to. It's 14, 12. There is a way which seems right unto a man, mm -hmm. but the end thereof are the ways of death. So see, well, I think, or I believe, or I, I don't love it. I was going to say I love it when. I, I actually dislike it when I read on the internet. Well, I'm pretty sure it says somewhere in the Bible, and then they say something that you know is not in the Word. Or they misquote it, or they flip it. And they think they know what they know, but they don't know what they don't know. And so there's a way that seems right in a man. We think we're right on that, but we've got to go back and check ourselves and make sure. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Exodus chapter 20. Does anybody know what Exodus chapter 20 is off the top of your head? Commandments. Commandments. That's right, Ten Commandments. I'm going to blow my nose. Oh, excuse me. All right. What's today? Shabbat. Today's Shabbat. So let's go to verse 8 of Exodus chapter 20. We're going to go through it and come back. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is King James. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. There are basically, I'm a binary thinker, right? There's two kinds of commandments. There's positive commandments uh, honor thy father and mother. That's something you do. That's positive. There's negative commandments. Thou shalt not do murder. Thou shalt not, says in King James, kill. That's a negative commandment. Do these things. Don't do these things. So on this, the fourth commandment, which I'm fond of saying the father spends the most words out of the ten explaining to us, is this a positive or a negative commandment? It's a positive, it's a positive commandment it says, um, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember Shabbat to keep it set apart, right? That's what that means. That's a positive thing. But then to explain it, the Father uses a lot of negatives. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. I mean, look at it. He says, remember it. Keep it set apart. Six days, do labor and do all thy work. So that's still positive. Now, that's important right there. Six days we labor. It doesn't mean, I just talked about this recently, it must be on my mind. It doesn't mean you work for the man six days, but you have stuff to do for six days. Well, something. You don't just lay up lazy, you know, on other days. Even people who are retired 
you still have to labor. See, Americans, I think many Americans have this concept that you start getting to be about my age, almost. Roger and I were having this conversation that he doesn't have this concept. But people think, oh, I'm going to go on Social Security and all I'm going to do is sit back and drink Jack Daniels and watch Oprah. And it's, it's, it's not what you do. We you still have stuff to like do. Year, we right? have to work. Right? You'll do it for about a year and then you'll die. So six days shall you labor. So we have to work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh the Elohim. Now here we get to the negatives. In it you shall not do any work. Does anybody have a different word than any work? Any work. You can't do any work. We're going we're gonna to break this open a little bit today. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant. So clearly some Israelites had servants, right? You can't work them either. If you were going to be a slave back in the day, it was good to be an Israelite slave because at least you got one day off, right? One day off a week. Uh, but not only that, not your cattle. You can't use your cattle to turn the mill or whatever. You can't, you know, you can't work your critters so your critters get a day off because cattle isn't just cows. When it's used in King James, cattle means herd-type animals like goats and sheep and stuff like that too nor the stranger that is within thy gates. What would be an example here of a stranger that's within our gates? Not today, but in general. Someone visiting. Someone visiting. But what about if I've got the gravel coming and they said we can only come on Saturday to deliver the gravel? That's within our gates, right? right. Sorry, can't do that. Can't work on Saturday. I've had to tell people that. We're not working on Saturday. What? Well, that's the only day we have available for the next three weeks. Can't do it. It says nobody, the stranger, that's not even an Israelite, in your gates. Can't work. For in six days, Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Let's go look at that. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. Because it just said in six days he made it. We're not going to read all six days. In fact, in chapter 1, it ends with, And Elohim saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, Elohim ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and he set it apart, says sanctified, because that in it he had rested from all his work which Elohim created and made. And so that's what that's referring to when we read about that in the Ten Commandments. Did he rest because he was worn out? No, he doesn't get worn out, right? But he saw it, he saw that it was good, he saw that it was complete, and he took the time to go, this is good, this is good, this is nice. And he enjoyed it, if you will, just the fact that it was done, and he didn't work at that time. Let's go to Genesis chapter 16. That's 15. No. Maybe Exodus 16. Hold on. My note says Genesis, but I bet it's Exodus. It makes more sense. Let's go to Exodus 16. Yep. I'm going to start at the beginning of 16, just to keep it in context of Exodus 16. And they took their journey from Elam, and the, all the congregation of the children of Israel, which came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing the land of Egypt. This is right after Passover, right after they left, right? 15th day. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel, this is the first day they're out. They're free from slavery. They got, they got released. They got told to go. They got to borrow stuff from the Egyptians, take stuff from the Egyptians. And the first day they're out there, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moshe and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, 
Would to Elohim we had died at the hand of Yahweh in the land of Egypt. Mitzrayim. When we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The murmuring congregation. That, a good thing that never happens here. <laughs> So here they are saying, oh, we, we might as well be dead. And then uh, Yahweh said unto Moshe, verse 4, Behold, check it out. I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. That I may, now my King James says, prove them whether they walk in my law or no. Does anybody have a different word than prove? Try. 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 It means test. I'm going to make heaven rain down, I'm going to make bread rain down from heaven every day. And I'm doing this, why? To feed the people? To test them. No. He's doing it to test them whether they walk in his law, in his Torah, or not. See, people think he was raining down manna from heaven, because we know it's going to be manna, we're going to get there, um, just to feed the Israelites. No, -uh. it's a test. He's doing it to test them. And it shall come to pass. Oh, and also, well, we'll get to there. It's every day, right? It shall come to pass that on the sixth day, what, what do we call the sixth day in this worldly system we're in? Friday. Friday. On the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So if Kate and I, to eat a day, have to gather a quart, and we eat a quart the next day, well, then that means on Friday we got to gather two, two quarts, quarts, which if you think about it means we have to work twice as hard on the sixth day to get ready for the Sabbath. And Moshe and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, at evening, then you shall know that Yahweh has brought you out from the land of Mitzrayim, from Egypt. And in the morning, when you shall see the glory of Yahweh, for he that hears your murmurings against Yahweh, and what are ye, we that you murmur against us? So here's Moshe getting a little bit upset with the people, and, and he's speaking on behalf of Aaron. He's like, what are you guys doing? You're, you're murmuring against us. You're murmuring against the Father. And who are we that you're murmuring against us? Can't you see we're trying to help you here? We're trying to help us here? And Moshe said... This shall be when Yahweh shall give you in the evening flesh to eat and in the morning bread to the full. For Yahweh hears your murmurings which you murmur against him. And what, oh, oh no, we just did that. Okay, nine. And Moshe spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before Yahweh, for he has heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. And Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At evening you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, for ye shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim. And it came to pass that at evening the quails came up, and they covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about the host, the camp, the army of Israelites. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So it's this little stuff. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, it says in King James, it is manna. Does anybody have something different? What is it? What is it? They called it, what's it? <laughs> what is it? That's what they called it. Manna means what is it? So they called it, what is it? What is it? For they knew not what it was. And Moshe said unto them, This is the bread which Yahweh has given you to eat. This is the thing which Yahweh commanded. Gather of it, now this is a command, Gather of it every man according to his eating. And over for every man according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. <coughs> That's kind of interesting. Who's gathering this manna? Men. Go gather it for your house. Who's supposed to be the breadwinner? The men, right? I mean, that's what he's doing. He's going out, he's getting the bread, and he's bringing it back. And you get as much as you need for your tents. And the children of Israel did so, and they gathered some more, some less. And when they did meet it with an omer, 
He that gathered much had nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered each man according to his eating. Give us this day our daily bread. Every day they go out and they get their daily bread, and it is given to them by Yah, right? It comes out the day before. And Moshe said, let no man leave of it till the morning. There's no leftovers, gang. You have to trust Yah that it's all going to work out. You have to trust Yah that what I gather this morning is going to be enough to feed us today, and then tomorrow I'll be able to go gather more. We're preppers, right? That makes us kind of a little bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? It's like, wait, you're telling me that the only food I'm going to have is the food I have for today? And then I'm not going to get any extra? I'm not going to put, start putting a little bit aside every day so that I end up with having two weeks worth of food or, or whatever? Like, nope, don't do that. Don't leave it till the morning. Because you have to trust Yah. 20. Notwithstanding. Does anybody have a different word than Notwithstanding. I think it should be not surprisingly at this point. <laughs> Notwithstanding, they did not listen. They hearkened not unto Moshe, but some of them left of it until the morning. Maybe they did it because they, they didn't trust Yah that there was going to be more. Maybe they did it because they were lazy. And they said, I don't want to get up in the morning and go work. Six <laughs> days shall thou labor. I got enough now. I'll just save it for tomorrow and I don't have to go work. I'll just eat it tomorrow. Some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms, and it stank. Hmm. And Moshe was angry with them. And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. And when the sun waxed hot, it melted. So you had to get out and do the work in the morning. If you, if you didn't get out in the morning and get it, it melted. Oops, you don't have any. So there's another thing about getting up and getting to it. And it came to pass that on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moshe, hey, we got it. We got two today. We understand you said get twice as much on Friday, so we're good. And he said unto them, this is that which Yahweh has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Shabbat, the set apart Shabbat unto Yahweh. Bake what you will bake today and seeth what you will seeth. Does anybody have a different word than see? Cook. Cook. And that which remains over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moshe Bay, and it did not stink, neither was there any worms therein. So clearly they baked this stuff, right? They cooked it. It's like grits. You know, you can boil grits. You can, can you fry grits? Yeah, I think so. There you go. So you can do different things. And so they, they, they've been eating this for a while. They're like, hey, I like doing it this way. I like doing it this way. And they're like, all right, whatever you're going to cook for tomorrow, do it today. Why are we doing it today? Why are we doing it on Friday? Because tomorrow is the rest of the set-apart Sabbath, the holy Sabbath unto Yahweh. That's why. It's a rest. Do no work. Do no labor. Don't make your maidservant do any work. Don't make your wife do any work. You don't do any work. And Moshe said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto Yahweh. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days shall you gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So you can't even gather it on Shabbat, because the Father's not putting it there to tempt you with. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day. Now, he told them not to do it. He told them there wasn't going to be any more, but they go out anyway for to gather, and they found none. And Yahweh said to Moshe, how long are you going to refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Who's in charge of Israel on the earthly scale? Moses. Moshe. Did Moshe tell the people, don't go out on Shabbat to get it? Yes. He did. He told them not to gather twice as much on Friday. Cook what you got to cook on Friday. He told them, and they went out, some of them went out and did it anyway. So who's Yah yelling at? Moshe. That's called responsibility, right? Moses, you're responsible for these people. Six days shall you gather it, but on some day with Sabbath in it, there shall be none. And it came to pass, they went out anyway, and they found none. And Yahweh said to Moshe, how long are you going to refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that Yahweh has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day, kind of enforced. 
The father yells at Moshe. Moshe goes back, talks to the leaders. It, it works its way all the way down. Hey, we're serious about this. And that's what they ate for 40 years. There's some confusion out there about cooking on Shabbat. We'll address that later today. Let's go to Numbers 15. How serious is this Shabbat thing? Numbers 15. It's them strangs of messianics wear on their britches. Mm. Echoes in my head all the time. Let's go to uh, verse 32 of Numbers 15. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. This also ties into what some people think about Shabbat. This dude is out there gathering sticks, right? And they found him. Well, if he was out there in the woods gathering sticks, that means they were out there too, right? They found him gathering sticks. Some people say you can't go anywhere. When it said stay in your tent that time, that was a one-time thing. It's like you guys are all restrictions. Stay in your tent. You guys aren't listening. They find him gathering sticks on Shabbat. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him, so clearly they're not in their tent, unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. So they're all there. And he put them in ward. That's like jail. Because it was not declared what they should be done to him. So they know he'd done wrong. He's gathering sticks on Shabbat, but they don't really know how serious this is. And so they bring him to Moses and Aaron. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, now see, there's a gap there. And if you look in my Bible, in the King James, there's like a paragraph break there. They brought him to Moses because they didn't know what to do. And the next sentence is, Yahweh said to Moshe, I think Moshe wandered off and said, Father, what do, what do we do? You know, you, you told us not to do it. Somebody did it. What do we do? And Yahweh said unto Moshe, the man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones outside of the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and they stoned him with stones. And he died, as Yahweh commanded Moshe. So they killed this guy because he was gathering sticks on Shabbat. They killed him because Yahweh said kill him. And Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments until Jesus comes back says throughout their generations. Mm -hmm. So forever. Make these fringes on the borders of your garments that they put upon the fringe and borders a ribbon of blue. I could turn this into a sermon on Zeep Zeep, but I'm not going to. And it shall be for you a fringe that you may look on it and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them. Because clearly you're having a hard time remembering not to do work on Shabbat. So now you all are going to wear fringes. Why? What's the number one reason why? To remember. To remember the commandments and do them. So you do the commandments. And this one specifically that brought this to the fore was not doing what you're supposed to do on Shabbat and doing what you're not supposed to do, the negatives, on Shabbat. He was out doing work. So you can look at it, remember all the commandments of Yahweh, and do them. And that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, which you use to go a-whoring. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Mm. You don't get to figure this out yourself. You don't get to decide what you feel good or what's convenient for you to do. It's what Yah said to do. And that's why you wear zit zit because clearly you can't remember this paragraph I told you about nobody does any work. So that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Be set apart unto Elohim. You're not like everybody else. I am Yahweh your Elohim, which brought you before the land of Mitzrayim. To be your Elohim, I am Yahweh your Elohim. And then we read right after that, which we're not going to read today, is Korah's rebellion. Because there were people in that camp murmuring, and they liked that old man. And they don't like Moshe. That, that was it. You killed the old... This is how they're looking at it. You killed the old man that we liked. All he was doing was picking up sticks on Shabbat. You killed him, and now you're telling us we all got to put strings on our britches? Hmm. We've had it. 
And then that's the rebellion of Korah. And then you see what happens to Korah, right? He gets swaddled up. So it's serious. Shabbat is serious. Pastor Joe, that's all Old Testament stuff. And see, I think, bless you, I think most of you get this. I know there's people out there in YouTube land who don't get this. I know there is, who are watching this. And some of you may not get it either, because I, I continue to be amazed sometimes. That's Old Testament. Well, let's go to New Testament. Let's go to Luke, chapter 4. Lucas. Luke, a chapter 4. Where am I going in Luke this time? 16. Talking about Yeshua. It says, when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on Shabbat, and he stood up to read. And there's another whole teaching that follows that. But what was Yeshua's custom on Shabbat? Go to the synagogue. And he read, because he was a rabbi, right? He was, he was upper. But he went to the synagogue on Shabbat. So clearly he didn't just stay in his house, right? He, he went, and it says, as was his custom. So if we're supposed to live, and we are, Christ-like lives, and he went to the synagogue, I almost took this sermon. There's a thing you guys can study on your own or we can talk to it later called a minyan. And it's a group of 10 people and one, 10 brothers actually. And once you get 10 together, we can actually have something and form a synagogue. And before that, we just kind of gather and pray and, and do the things until we have enough people. But Yeshua gets into town. He rolls into Nazareth. He finds a synagogue and he goes because it's his custom on Shabbat to go. So what do you think everybody else's custom pretty much was? On Shabbat. I think there are a bunch of other guys there at least. There were, right? They're at Shabbat. They're at, so to gather. I made a comment recently to somebody and I said, you're not supposed to cook on Shabbat. No cooking on Shabbat. Doesn't happen. And this person came back to me. I love it, which means I don't love it. When people try to quote me some little cherry picked verse out of the Bible, to, to like supposedly prove their point. And this is the verse they use. Let's go to Luke uh, chapter 6. Because according to this person, clearly I didn't understand what I was talking about. And it came to pass on the second Shabbat after the first. It's a week. First day's a high holy day. He went through, the, now it says in King James, cornfields. Mine says grain. It is grain, because corn is a new world crop, and they haven't discovered it yet, and corn means grain. So it's a grain field, so it's probably barley or something like that, right? So they're walking through the cornfield, and his disciples plucked ears of grain, and they did eat, rubbing it in their hands. Why are they rubbing it in their hands? Get the chaff off. Get the chaff off. That's happening right now, too. We were talking about that earlier, sitting over there at that table. The father is separating the wheat from the chaff. The father is separating, getting ready to separate the goats and the sheep. There's a falling away that's happening, and that's happening. But right now, these guys are walking through a field. They're walking with Yeshua. On what day? Shabbat. Shabbat. The they're Saturday. taking a walk on Shabbat. The they're walking through a field. It's a grain field, and the guy's hungry. I remember when we first came to Torah thinking we might, we might have to fast. We met a family that thought they had to fast on Shabbat. You know, this cut to the chase on that. You don't have to fast on Shabbat. And so they get some grain in their hands, and they're going to eat it. They did eat it. They get the stuff off, and they eat the grain. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do you that which is not lawful to do on Shabbat? You're not allowed to gather grain and eat it on Shabbat. And process the grain. Now, these people are with Yeshua. Did Yeshua ever break one little bit of Torah? He no. did not. Do you think he's going to let his guys blatantly around him break Torah? So if the Pharisees, does it say Pharisees? Yeah, the Pharisees say, hey, why are you letting them break the law? Why are you letting them break Torah? It's kind of like when we read something in the Bible that seems to contradict itself, we need to check ourselves because we have bad understanding. 
Clearly the Pharisees don't know who they're talking to, and they need to check themselves. And Yeshua answered them and said, Have you not read so much as this, what Dawid David did when himself was a hungered, and they which were with him, and how he went to the house of Elohim, and did take and eat of the showbread, which is only for the priests, and gave also to them which were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone? And he said unto him that the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Did they cook that grain? No. They did not cook that grain. They picked it as they went along and they ate. Uh, on Shabbat here, Brother Cody will show up in the, in the late summer. And, and if you haven't seen him do this, when all our blackberries are blooming, he's like, dum, 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 <laughs> and he's eating them. I've had somebody here before go, is that okay to do on Sabbath? Hello? Yes, that is perfectly okay to do. Would I let Brother Cody go do that in my presence if it wasn't okay? No, I wouldn't. But he's not making a, a blackberry pie. Um, let's go to Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, New Testament. Anyway, the fact that they picked grain is not that they were cooking. All right, so the two don't go together. Luke 14, verse 1. And it came to pass when he, Yeshua, went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Shabbat. Oh, so here's Yeshua visiting somebody on Shabbat, and he's sitting down to eat. Mm -hmm. He's got to have a meal with somebody. So clearly he's not fasting on Shabbat. They watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had dropsy. And Yeshua answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees, because see, he knew what they were thinking already. And he said, hey, what do y'all think, you fellow studiers of Torah? Is it lawful to heal on Shabbat? That's what he says on the Sabbath day. They held their peace. They're not answering. They don't want to be caught in this one. Has anybody ever done that before? You ask a question and no one wants to answer you? Because they're afraid of getting trapped because they feel he took him and he healed him and he let him go. And he answered them. See, he knew what they were thinking. That's what he's answering. He answered them saying, which of you shall have an ass, a donkey, or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straight away pull him out on the Sabbath day? All you guys thinking I did something wrong by healing that guy on Shabbat. Which one of you who thinks I did wrong by healing this man wouldn't pull your own animal up out of a hole that it fell into if it happened to be Shabbat. Y'all know you would. And then the implication being there is people is more important than animals. They could not answer him again on these things. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Anybody remember what Matthew 24 is about? What's going to happen the at the end, end of the time? The end, that's right. Almost the end. Mm. Matthew 24, verse 20. But this is Yeshua speaking. Pray ye. Matter of fact, we'll start in 15. When therefore you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who and so too readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And let him which be in the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. When you see this happening, flee, is what he's saying. And directly flee to the mountains. When you see this thing happening, you don't have time to go pick up your bug out bag. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them which give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Does he say your flight's not going to be in winter? No. He does not. Does he say your flight's not going to be on Sabbath? No. no, he doesn't. He says, pray it's not. But the first thing he told you was when you see these things happen, flee. Does that sound like arduous to you? We're fleeing to the mountains? Yes. It's pretty hard, right? We're running to the mountains. Pray you don't have to do that on Shabbat, is what he's saying. But he didn't say if it's on Shabbat, stay where you are, mm -hmm. right? It's an, ex it's an exception almost, if you will. In fact, 
I have one here. Somewhere. I thought. Here we go. You guys have this? The Apocrypha? I think you can buy it for like six bucks on Amazon. It's good. There's a chapter in here called Maccabees, 1st Maccabees. There's a story, because what he's talking about, did these things kind of happen in 70 AD, Matthew yes. 24? They did. Are they also going to happen again? They are. It's a type. There's, there's patterns throughout the Bible. Uh, Mattathias, Romans are in charge. They set up an altar in the temple, and, they, and then also in other places, and they say, y'all are going to come offer offerings to our gods on this thing. And so some of the Israelites are like, okay, well, you know, you said I had to get this COVID vaccine, so I guess I'll do it. I mean, that's basically, it's related to that. They're telling you what you have to do, and it goes against what they believe, and so they're doing it. And so some of them are saying yes, and Matthias comes up and goes, oh, heck no, we're not doing it. And then things happen, and they flee the Jews who say, we're not going to do this thing. Well, it's the new way. You have to do it. You have to get the mark of the beast, whatever. They flee to the mountains. While they're in the mountains, here comes the bad guys. They see them coming. There's a fight coming. And a group of these people flee that have fled to the wilderness that are hiding out, see the enemy coming, see the Romans coming, and they have a discussion. Hey, man, it's Shabbat. Should we fight on Shabbat? And they're like, you know what? I think the Father will bless us if we don't. We'll be okay and we won't fight. Does anybody know what happened to those people? Yes. They, got slaughtered. they got slaughtered. Them, their critters, their wives, their kids, everybody got killed. Well, there's another group hanging out in the woods, another camp under Mattathias. And uh, they saw what happened to those other guys. So they have a little discussion. They have a little talk amongst themselves. They're like, hey, that did not go well for our brethren. What are we going to do? If they come and attack us. Because if we continue with this pattern where we refuse to fight on Shabbat, they're just going to keep attacking us on Shabbat and they're going to wipe us out from the earth. We're not going to exist. Does the Father want us dead? No. So they decide they're going to fight. If the fight comes to them, they're going to fight. But they also decide we're not going to initiate any battles on Shabbat. And if we get in the fight, it's a military tactic. If, if people are coming and they attack you and you're fighting them back and you start winning and they start running away, militarily, you chase them down and kill them because they're fleeing, right? They're, you, you, wanna get, you do kick them when they're down. That's a military thing. But they decided, well, if they're running away on Shabbat, we're going to let them go. Wow. We're not, so we're going to defend ourselves on Shabbat, but we're not going to pursue on Shabbat. And it works out for them. Um, so uh, that's pray it not come in winter, that your flight not come in winter. So now we get to, okay, I get it, PJ. We can do no work. What is work? How many people have heard that there's groups of believers who turn all the lights on that they went on on Friday before the sun goes down so they don't have to flip a switch? Right. Oh, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> and that's a combination of fire you, you won't kindle a fire on the Sabbath day. We didn't go there, but you're not supposed to kindle a fire. Um, and so they're saying, well, electricity is a spark and it's a fire. And it's also work to flick a switch. And so let's get the switches where we want them on Friday night. I don't know if they sleep with little eye shades. On <laughs> um, what is work? Without making the sermon three hours long, another thing is money. Anything you do that makes you money, that you do and you get compensated for, that's work. You don't do that on Shabbat. So you don't make money on Shabbat. Um, I'll give you personal examples of that after this. So anything that you're doing to make money, don't do that on Shabbat. You're really not supposed to buy anything on Shabbat. Because if I buy something from Cody, well, then I'm making him work. I mean, basically, it's a transaction that's going on there. So you don't buy or sell. And I have been to these Hebrew conferences. They drive me crazy because they have them on the weekend. And here's some dude with like his five CDs or DVDs that he's put out in his books and stuff like that. And they have a table and they're selling their stuff on Shabbat. Remember Yeshua going into the temple, flipping tables over? 
wonder what they'd do if I went to one of those things that actually started flipping tables on Shabbat. Like, oh, we're not selling it. You just put your name down here and you can pay us afterwards. Or they'll tell you on Friday, you can pay today. We're going to have this stuff out tomorrow. And, and it, they're doing the pharisaical thing of trying to get around the whole deal. You don't buy or sell on Shabbat. So you don't do it. Um, you don't make anybody else work. So you don't go to a restaurant because you're making somebody work for you when you do that. You don't let them come to your place and work for you because they're doing that for money. You also don't do anything on Shabbat if you want to think about it because, well, I do have a job. But before I had that job, I still did stuff all around here, right? You don't do stuff for your own gain on Shabbat. It's like that cupboard door really needs to be fixed. It's like, you don't do that on Shabbat, right? It, that's, you're going to make your life better, you know, whatever. It's like, no, you don't do that on Shabbat. Um, production. You don't do anything producing. If you don't work on your novel, you don't, uh, if you're an artist that you sell your art, you don't paint that. You don't work on that. You know, it's like, oh, now I have time to work on this painting that I'm going to sell. You don't, uh... I don't know, we were talking about making arrows earlier. You don't make arrows that you sell at the craft fair, you know, or whatever. Well, I like going and I spread the good news of Jesus when I go. No, you don't do that. Um, I've had people ask me many times, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I've wanted to give the sarcastic answer, which you're going to get it when, when I tell you this. Is it okay if I work out on Shabbat? Do push-ups, go for a run, do crunches or whatever, you know, because I work out every day, man. Is it okay if you what? Work. Work out? No, it's not okay if you work out on Shabbat. It's not okay. That's work. If you're doing something and it's making you all sweat and whoo, no, you don't do that. Can you take a walk? Yes, you can take a walk. Can you take a power walk? No. It's your heart. That's getting to your heart, right? What are you doing? But if you're doing work on Shabbat and working out is work. You know, you're going to go do run, you're going to do whatever. No, you don't get to do that Shabbat. Chill out. Take a break. You don't understand. I work at my job all week long and I only get to do my good workouts. When I ran ultra marathons, when do you think I did my 30 mile runs every week? Saturday. Saturday. Did them on Saturday because Sunday I went to church. No, you don't get to do that. You're supposed to rest. Brother Cody has told me several times the cool thing about Shabbat is naps. And we had another brother who first taught us Torah that said Shabbat naps are awesome. This is a good thing, but I'm still in the knots. Cooking. You can't cook on Shabbat. I heard somebody the other day say, well, my wife normally cooks, but I like to cook, so I'm going to cook on Shabbat. No, you can't cook on Shabbat. I like splitting wood. I actually like splitting wood. I'm a guy who also, weird, I like sweeping. I don't know, there's something weird about it. I like getting everything all in one place and like, I get it moved. And I don't know, I feel like I'm playing army or something. I like sweeping. I like splitting wood. I like to, whoo, and it goes through and it's like, yes, makes me feel good. No, you cannot work on Shabbat. So what do you eat on Shabbat? Can we plug in, can we plug in a, uh, what are they called? Crock, -pot. crock pots. Yeah, you can plug in a crock pot. It's not work. But if you put raw chicken in your crock pot and the potatoes and all that, because there's a way to cook in a crock pot, no. But if you want to warm up something that you cooked, that you baked or seethed on Friday, go ahead. You can do that. That's not work. But you can't cook. Can you make a sandwich? Yeah. Yeah, you can make a sandwich. You're not cooking. You're not baking. You're not boiling. You can make a sandwich, slap some bread, throw something together and eat it. That's okay. Just do the work the day before. So if you're going to cook your meat to do it, you got to do it. Um, gathering. Talked about Brother Cody eating blackberries. And you're not the only one, but you're sitting right there. Yeah, you can pick and eat on Shabbat. What you can't do is fill a basket with blackberries, in this case, that you're going to take home and can later. Uh-uh. That's, that's more than what you need. Pick and eat, pick and eat, that's okay. Uh, that's what the disciples are doing when they were walking through the field. Now, we come to Torah, and our life hasn't changed yet completely when we first come to Torah. We've got to get our 
our worldly life in line with our beliefs. And that takes time. Paul was in that conundrum. He's out there teaching Gentiles, the Goy, the non-Jews, all about Yeshua and keeping Torah. And here comes these Jews behind him who were followers of Yeshua. But they're like, hey man, only Jews get into this religion. Okay, it's Jews who follow Yeshua. And you're teaching these Greeks and stuff. You can't do that. And so they said, dude, before you teach these, because a Jewish curse, like a curse for somebody, was like those uncircumcised heathens. Right? The uncircumcised, the unwashed, the unclean, the other. Right? That's how they referred to like not good people, the uncircumcised. They're like, dude, you cannot talk to these guys unless they're circumcised. Let's put this in real terms. Here comes Paul into a village and he's talking to 30 and 40 year old dudes and he goes, I got some cool stuff to tell you about this guy named Jesus, Yeshua. <laughs> but before we get begin, let's all get circumcised. <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna listen to that message? Nobody's going to, because they don't know why, right? And so they were trying to stop him for that. And so it takes us a while to get our life lined up with our beliefs. I have had people come to me and say, is it okay if I, my job is making me work on Saturday? Is it okay if I work on Saturday? I'll tell you, and overall, the answer is no. I'm not picking on you. I'm just using you as an example. Well, I'm a nurse. Nurses have asked me that. Cops have asked me that. Is, you know, I work on Saturday. Is it lawful to do good on Shabbat? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did Yeshua heal on Shabbat? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. If someone's having a heart attack or they're having surgery and they need a doctor, a nurse, an anesthesiologist, and, and somebody to mop the floor so there's no germs coming into their wound... Is it okay for them to work on Shabbat? Yes, it's okay. But, but, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, I think we're going to 23. All things... So is it lawful for me as a nurse or me as a cop to work a wreck, right? Or to keep somebody from dying or something. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And so here's what I say about the jobs where you're actually helping somebody. And nurse, doctor is easy, right? That's an easy one. They're not doing anything bad. They're helping people live. They're like Yeshua. They're healing people. Did Yeshua seek out people to heal on Shabbat? He did not. He's going about his business and he runs into them and he heals them. He didn't open up Yeshua's healing clinic on Shabbat. And so what I tell you is this. It's the concept. The Father wants you to rest. To the extent that you can take the day off on Shabbat, you should take the day off on Shabbat. If you're in one of those healing type things, you should try to enjoy Shabbat with the Father. So don't seek out work for good. Do not hesitate to do good. If you see some old lady on the side of the road on your way to services on Shabbat and it's raining and she's out there struggling to try and figure out what to do with this flat tire and her car's in the ditch and her grandson's in the back seat screaming, you better stop and get muddy and help this lady out of her predicament. Right? Because you're doing well. But you don't decide, well, on Shabbat, so I'm going to do the drive around and look for people to help on the road. <laughs> you don't do that. But if the Father puts somebody in your way, you help them. So that's what you don't do. Which is what the Father spent most of talking to us about the fourth commandment. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But what do you do? Let's go back to that. We are in Exodus, what was that, chapter 20? Uh -huh. Yep, Exodus chapter 20. What do we do? Genesis, Exodus. If I had a computer screen, it would already be up there. All right, here we go. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. So the first thing we do is keep that day set apart. That day should be different. That day should feel different to us on Shabbat. It should be set apart. Who's it set apart to? Yahweh. It's set apart to Yahweh, right? So we should rest. That's the first thing we should do is rest. You should chill. If you feel like taking a nap on Shabbat, you should take a nap. I mean, you really should. You should. The Father knows what our body, he designed it, he built it. And it's like, you can work six days, but man, you've got to take a day off. And it's not a day in seven, it's the seventh day, mm -hmm. right? But the first thing we should do is rest. What was Yeshua, uh, Yeshua. What was Yeshua's custom on, on Shabbat? Go to the He'd go to the synagogue, and he was reading, right? So we should gather, we should read the word. We should, as individuals, not just rely on Pastor Joe to say, turn here and read this, turn here and read this. See, it all makes my point. Turn here and read this. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? No, you should read the word. You should take the time because guess what? And this sounds terrible, but I know how Americans think. You got nothing else to do today, right? You're not mowing your lawn. You're not polishing your shoes. You're not, you know, cooking a great spaghetti. Read the word. You have time. The Father has given you permission to chill out and just read his word. And we should assemble. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 25. Yeshua did. He went to the synagogue, as was his custom. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, I think. I'll start in 24. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke us to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day's approaching, and the more we need to gather more, not less. We don't need to be like those other people who don't get together. We need to get together. It was Yeshua's habit to get together. He'd go to the synagogue, he'd hang out with people. He was eating with a Pharisee, he went out to eat after. Right? You know, if you think about it like that, he went out to eat and he's eating with that guy. Um, Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> Oh, I marked it. Acts 16, verse 13. And all the Sabbath, so it's all the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and we spake unto the women which resorted thither. And then that goes on to a neat story. But they're going out and they're seeking believers. They roll into this town at Shabbat. And they're like, you know what? Let's go out. I hear there's some believers that are gathering down by the river. Let's go down to the river to pray. Worrying about that good old way. But, right. But that, they were down there praying. And he's like, hey, there's some believers down there. Let's go talk to them on Shabbat. And so that is a form of gathering. And so you should pray. And it's not just the, the little simple prayers we do here. You should spend time with the Father praying on Shabbat. He's cutting out a whole day for you to remove the noise of what's going on. Um, it is a different day. And it doesn't matter what you think you're supposed to do. It matters what the Father tells us we're supposed to do and not do. And it doesn't matter if it's not convenient for you to do that. It is not convenient for me not to work. It is not convenient for you to keep Torah then, I guess, is what, it's, what you're amounting to. And so I get it. I was in the position that many people are when you first come to Torah, and my life is structured this way, and it's like I've got to figure out a way to get out of this. And maybe after this when we talk, maybe my son will share his story or not. But I'm telling you, if you start trying to be obedient and you pray to the Father, he will make a way for this to work out for you. Mm -hmm. That you're not just in chaos living on the street in a, in a hovel because you said, I'm not working, and they fired you. There, there's a way, there are ways to do this. Um, but the first thing is in your heart, decide you're going to be obedient and you're going to follow and love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And loving means doing what he tells you to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, don't work on Shabbat. Let's pray.